education is never neutral. It is always a political act. Good morning, and welcome to this panel on depoliticizing the classroom, racial agendas. My name is Winkdell Franklin Twyman Jr., but were my parents thinking, but you can call me Wink for short, which is very uh, user friendly. Uh, I will be your moderator for today's panel. I'm very excited, as you can probably tell from my voice and my demeanor. I was born in 1961 in Richmond, Virginia. I later moved with my wife, Skylar, to San Diego in 1992. And in San Diego, we raised three wonderful children to Delta. And so, so far you know about me that I'm an American, native to Virginia, and a southerner by birth. I'm proud of that. The fact that I'm a black male should be of little consequence. However, even though my wife and I raised our kids in that manner, fatalism entered our home over time. I mentioned I have three kids who were raised to adulthood. One day, and it's like one of those watershed days in your life, I'm 63 years old, and I remember this date. On April 21st, 2018, a family member said to me, blackness is oppression, nothing else matters. Well, ladies and gentlemen, my head turned around like Regan in the movie Exorcist, I could not believe what I was hearing. My wife and I did not raise our kids in that way. We always raised our kids to believe the world was their oyster and that they could seize the day, always. We always chose the most challenging schools for them. So I wondered, where did this come from? Did it come from our home? And by the way, the family member who made this statement of fatalism, dogma, I call it, was far from oppressed. This family member had a dad who was Harvard Law School educated, had a mom who was Yale University educated, had a grandma who was college educated, had great grandparents who were college educated. This person had a great, great, great grandfather who was a college professor at Avery Institute in Charleston, South Carolina in the late 1800s. Ladies and gentlemen, those who know their black American history will consider how seldom a black person became a college professor at a college in the late 1800s. This family member had a great, great, great grandfather who made American history, was the first black congressman on the House side. She had a 7x great grandfather who founded the first a uh, self-help group for black Americans in the new world in 1790. So I was just thinking, the slogan, blackness is oppression, nothing else matters, had no connection to our home family life or reality. And so I began to write. And I discovered my co-author, Jen, Jennifer Richmond, and we created something to tell our tale. Today, I'm hoping uh, that we'll have from our esteemed panelists some insight into how the dogma, blackness is oppression, nothing else matters, enters into a black American household and begins to change that mindset of success. So first we have, and I'm delighted to introduce, uh, a noted essayist and writer on race and identity in America, Michael Bowen. Michael is a prolific writer, let me tell you. And he's a keen observer of the human condition, which I appreciate. When you read Michael's stuff, you're not reading dogma. You're not reading spoken words. You're getting a piercing insight into the human condition, which I love. Because as we all know, humanity is what? Nuanced and complex. Nuanced and complex. I love it about Michael's writing. Michael's associated with the free black uh, platform online. Uh, he has written an essay, which I just consider one of the best I've read this year, 
It was an analysis of the black privilege divide. Michael essentially wrote about his travels throughout the country in over 10 different locales, some city, some country, some rural, some mountainous, and it was a beautiful presentation of life as Michael saw it, free of racial dogma, free of racial spoken words. I recommend it to you at some point. But in any event, as if it's not already apparent, I'm a fan of Michael's. We need more courageous, honest, insightful, observant, perceptive, introspective writers. And Michael brings that to the public square. I give you Michael Bowie. <laughs> Next up is someone who I haven't known that long, but boy, am I impressed. Uh, Eric Smith is a former professor at York College, and he's currently a research scholar, fellow at the Cato Institute. Uh, I love Eric, he has a warm spot in my heart, because he graciously agreed to read the foreword for our book. Once again, letters in black and white, a uh, new correspondence in Grace in America. And what I loved about Eric was, well, two things. One, circle back. Eric actually uh, moderated a panel discussion about our book with the uh, Cato Institute, and for that I was eternally grateful. But more importantly, I appreciate Michael and his insight into rhetoric the failures of communication. And I quote from Michael's belief, the benefits of mature and honest dialogue, the need to embrace America's virtues in the face of its vices, and the promise of classical liberal values. Couldn't have said it better myself. Thank you for being here, uh, Eric. And then we have Last but not least, Jimmy Sonny. He is, in my regard, a Renaissance man. He is a graduate of the San Francisco Conservatory of Music, a pastor. By the way, I'm a nephew of several pastors. We have that in common a little bit. He's a professional musician and author the founder and CEO of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel, IBSI for short. And you know, as if that work was not enough to fulfill his calling in life, he is also, and has served as the diversity outreach coordinator for the over 10 million member Christians United for Israel, CUFI for short. But you know something, when all is said and done, I think his greatest accomplishment is that he's been married for 36 years to his wife, Valerie. And he has, if I'm correct, six children and three grandchildren. I give you Dumasani, Washington. <laughs> We're gonna have a great panel today, I'm excited. But unfortunately, we only have 50 minutes. So we may have to abbreviate our comments uh, during the actual panel, but you're always free to talk to them after the panel is over. Shall we begin? Education is never neutral. It is always a political act. Those words were written on October 4th, 2024, by critical studies professor Henry A. Giroux. You may recognize the name. Giroux is a distinguished scholar in critical pedagogy at McMaster University in Hamilton, Ontario, Canada. What do those words mean in the classroom? I thought to myself, like, what is the context? Does it mean that in Brooklyn, in a fourth, day, fourth grade classroom, you have Black Lives Matter, BLM in the classroom? And I thought about that more. What does that mean? Well, according to the National Education Association, in a source titled, Making Black Lives Matter at School, they told us. The agenda, the mindset of BLM at school is, in a country that has always defined norms and rules through a white, cis, hetero, Judeo, Christian, ableist lens, wow, we have no option but to imagine and then build a radically different world in which black lives matter 
Because as you know, this is a world still deeply infested in further black suffering. My, I turn to my panelists. Is education a political act, given the context and racial agendas? And if education is a political act, what can be done about it? Michael, start us off. Thanks, Lee. <clears throat> I would say um, it happens. Uh, oh, yeah. Yes, it happens. Um, I, I myself am a Cold War kid, and uh, I certainly went through the uh, uh, the five minute walk jog from the Kennedy administration. We all wanted to wear kids. We all wanted to beat the commies. We all wanted to be astronauts. Uh, and so you can take that as a start. And I've been talking to folks here, and I want people to understand that what's happening is a narrowing of our focus, of our education, uh, and it is becoming more and more politicized. Everything has a political spin to it. And um, I was fortunate a couple weeks ago to have lunch uh, with Muzal Garbi, and uh, his focus, uh, his undergraduate was philosophy, and I'm very much in tune with that, but also in sociology, and my parents were sociologists. And he said 90% of sociology research is focused on inequality. And because of that, we take these five or six demographic things, essentialisms, that were supposed to not be relevant we should say, regardless of gender, age, creed, religion. Uh, and now we try to make specific weights on them and say, these people are not equal, and they should be equal. And that's a political agenda which is poison the humanities. It's captured sociology. So the first thing I want to say is there's anthropology. And nobody's been saying anthropology. It's like nobody goes into that matter of study where we actually study the way that people build their cultures. And that could be an antidote uh, for ethnic studies. But also, as an engineer, I tell people, you know, there wasn't computer science when I was young. It wasn't a field that anybody could aspire to. And you look at Amazon, which has made billions and billions of dollars in profits for its shareholders, uh, for its employees. And they don't ever ask you what your race is. How do they do all that business without having you sign a statement that says, this is my ethnicity? Thank you, Michael. Um, you know, before politics, there was human dignity, creative expression, and the individual. Next up, Eric. I want to start by uh, uh, backing up a little bit and not talking explicitly about politics, but about ideology. Uh, a lot of people who share our sentiments about um, the um, current culture wars want ideology out of the classroom, um, understandably so. However, um, what we tend to expect from education, um, critical thinking, um, the ability to reason, and, and, and rationalize, uh, the ability to listen uh, and be open-minded, things like that. That's an ideology, right? It's just the one that I like. <laughs> um, and it's also the one that um, classical liberals like, it's the one that the founders like, it's the one that MLK liked. Um, it's often called liberal arts education. Um, and it's something that I value so much that I became an academic. Um, however, and we'll get back to politics right now, um, in, in order to push one's agenda or one's new ideology, one has to do his or her best to demonize the old ideology, and that's where politics come in. And um, suddenly, uh, critical thinking and, and reason and rationalization are white ways of knowing. Right? Suddenly being open-minded and, uh, and curious about things is uh, something only the privileged can do. Um, so uh, that's where we are right now. Um, so our politics in education, yes, 
Is that always a bad thing? Yes. <laughs> but is ideology always a bad thing? No. Now the only reason it's political is because that ideology is one that is embraced by uh, typically moderate, uh, people in a moderate part of the, uh, the spectrum, right? And others are either far left or sometimes far right, right? So that's where the politics come in. But ultimately it's an issue of ideology. And I, I want to emphasize that because I think we need to start talking about ideology and not politics. Uh, because that's deeper. You know, um, it's, it's, it's at the ground floor level. And we need to start there. Thank you, Eric. Uh, you know, for me, the eternal values are curiosity, civic disagreement, and the individual. Now, for the Diazani. Um, so I would tend to view both gentlemen, um, that um, yes, the, the, the answer to the question is education political in the United States of America today, yes, has been for several decades at this point, and has been detrimental to say the least, uh, because of what well, we see the results of, I mean, the, a conference like this exists in large part because of the politicization of the classroom. Um, and. Um, and, and to Eric's brilliant point in terms of ideology, you can't do it. You, if you're going to sign Steinbeck and Shakespeare, you, you're signing ideology. You really are, um, which is really not a bad thing. Uh, once that ideology is demonized, now we have a fight. Right? And so this is kind of the, the fight that we've been in, which is an existential fight for this country. Um, so yes, I believe it is political. It should not be. And then as educators, that we're human beings, so we have to do the best that we can in the classroom setting, whatever that classroom is, whether it's a home school, whether it's a middle school, to give the children knowledge, give them access to it, teach them to think, but not try to brainwash them and, and having a certain uh, mindset. Uh, but yeah, it's just, it is political, and that's the, the, the large problem of where we are now. Thank you. You know, I'm not oppressed, you're not oppressed, you're not oppressed, but we're all humans. It's kind of my attitude about the situation. And now on to the second question. You know, I never attended a race-based affinity group in grade school, K through 12. Um, my student groups were like the student council, the honor society, the gifted and talented program, band class, the debate team. They were all color and different. And mind you, as you know from my backstory a little bit, I am a native of Virginia. I'm a southerner by birth. I came of age in a suburban small town Republican high school and junior high school that was perhaps 3% black and 8% black. And yet I excelled. I had fun. I prospered. My teachers loved me as my colleagues know written my suspect essay. Yes, they did like me. And so, <laughs> I hope so. I think they did. And so my point is I did just fine. I turned out well, don't you think? I can speak, I can talk, make an argument, I can read, I can write. But yet on the other hand, my older son and daughter, who attended a top 50 secondary school in the country, what are the top, they joined and participated in a black students union, and they had a totally different experience from me in terms of race. Remember the family member who said, Blackness is oppression, nothing else matters. I'm sure she, he or she regrets saying that at this point. But my point is, um, and to the panelists, what short stories and experiences can you share with us on this question of race-based affinity groups on students? First, Michael. Sure. How many people in here know your blood type? Okay. I bet most of you are O. O positive is the largest blood type in the world. So if you look at yourself that way, you're not a minority. <laughs> I, I raised the question of Amazon before because they know specific things about you for specific reasons. And you have specific reasons to disclose things about yourself for specific purposes. And you need to open that up. You need to evade these definitions which are fixed and understand, as Wink says, 
Black is different now than it was when I was born. When I was born, there were 20 million Negroes in America, and they were mostly poor. So you could pretty much guess, on average, without thinking much, well, they're poor, and they probably don't have a good education. At the turn of the century, there are almost double that many, and the overwhelming majority are middle class. So what happened? Blackness changed. People went from one place to another. And yet, still people think about race in terms of the Negro problem. The Negro problem has been solved. The Negro's problem was, I always have to look over my shoulder to see if I'm going to get treated as a citizen, if I can get an education at all, if I can spend a night in a hotel in a city I've never been before. That's not our problem today. Our problem is to be able to look forward and save ourselves from these boxes where the small minds are taking over. So think ways and, and go against grouping, even if it's Gen Z, all right? Because it sneaks into the rhetoric. Some of you will know what skibbity is, all right? And you give each generation their own vocabulary, their own aesthetic, and say what came before you was no good. They watch movies from Rotten Tomatoes. They just have a number. They don't know what a film critic is. All right, so enhance those things. There's lots of ways to know people. Get them to talk about those things. Turn this thing over and look them in the eyes and say, tell me something about you that ordinary people might not know. For me, I have one flat foot and one normally arched foot. So I tend to walk around in circles. <laughs> Thank you, Michael. Uh, Eric, what are your thoughts on race and affinity groups in school? Well, first of all, I love the uh, blood type thing you just did there. I love it. I'm going to steal it. But I will cite you. <laughs> um, my um, story is short. Um, it just involves uh, undergraduate and graduate experience. Um, as an undergraduate, there was a, um, you know, um, African-American, um, <coughs> excuse me, um, union group, or, you know, uh, an affinity group. And um, it was fine, but I felt like it wasn't doing anything. It was there to make people feel better about things. It was there for people to gripe and things like that. And I already felt good and didn't feel like griping. So I didn't, I, I, there was no point of me going there. Um, graduate school, however, I went to uh, a graduate and undergraduate African American uh, affinity group. Um, and, you know, it was what I expected the first time. The second time, a speaker shows up and his thesis for his argument, this is, this is what he said. Uh, he said, we need to stop uh, trying to talk to all the students, all the smart students about being leaders. We got to go to the, you know, the gang leaders and focus on them, you know, um, so that they can lead people out. And I got it to some point, but he was ignoring everybody else and focusing on um, the gang people. And um, there was applause afterwards, but um, guess who pushed back? Um, I wasn't invited back after that, <laughs> but um, that's okay. I was accused of um, disrespecting my elders, you know, um, when I did that, which is, all right, this is a digression, I'm sorry. Okay, so I, I've always had an issue with the disrespect your elders thing, right? I love my elders, I love that they've been through all kinds of different things and that I should listen and respect them. But I mean, there's a line, right, you know? <laughs> Like, if, 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 if my grandfather says that two plus two is banana, I'm, I'm not gonna, I have to believe him because he's 80? No, right? Right, right, right. All right I'm done, sorry. I just <laughs> had, to, had to do that. And, and let me just say, I, I'm not saying that affinity groups are inherently bad or anything like that. Uh, I, I, I think it's fine if you want to do that. Some people are against it wholeheartedly. Um, I, I think if you want to celebrate a culture, your culture, and get together with others from that culture, that is fantastic. I just think that um, when we say affinity group these days, we, we tend to be saying grievance group. And, and, and that's the issue I have. So I just wanted to make that clear. Okay, thank you.
Tell us something. So, um, like Eric, I'm start from where Eric left off, affinity groups, and call them that way, black student unions, those types of things, are, I agree, are not inherently bad. I, I think that I'll take a little bit different trek here chronologically and say the reason why they have been so prolific over the 20, 30, 40 years plus is because of the lack of identity. Now I'm speaking specifically within the African American community. Mm -hmm. The lack of identity because of the, the destruction of what was a more holistic black community. Now this is what I learned from my parents. I'm a product of the 60s as well. I was born in the late 1960s in North of Rock, Arkansas. Uh, during the segregated South. Uh, we moved to California when I was a baby, so I didn't grow up there, but we'd go back from time to time, and I learned about our community there from my mother and my father. We had long conversations, especially my mother, who graduated from Scipio A. Jones High School in North Little Rock, Arkansas, the only high school that took black students during that time. And so it was the pride of North Little Rock. Doctors, lawyers, politicians, I mean, so these, there was no Pell Grants, there was no, none of those things. You worked hard, you did, and you accomplished. My mother's very, very proud. I'm saying that because uh, it was from her that I learned about the civil rights struggle as it pertained to education especially. I'll just take this really quickly. She said to me, Sonny, the fight organically, I'm paraphrasing, was not to desegregate. It was for equal distribution of tax revenues because what happened in the segregated South is that the property taxes go to go to the school board in the racist situation, they would take the lion's share, give it to the white schools, and say they would have up-to-date textbooks, lab equipment, all those things. And the black parents weren't saying, we want to go to the white school. They're saying, stop taking our revenues because they were, but often, often their test scores were outpacing the white schools. So they're like, no, we're good. And then in the context of the quote Malcolm X, only a fool will let its enemy educate his children. Their mindset was if they don't want us there, why would we want to be there? And the reason I'm saying all of that is that when, and this is not anti-integration, please, that's not what I'm doing, I'm giving you some context here. That once integration, that became the thrust of what Dr. King and Bayard Rustin were doing, but that wasn't the original goal. The original goal was equal distribution. It became integration, that became the goal and she said the fear was that once that happened, the black schools, because they had black administrators and principals and educators and publishers, would be put out of business. And that's exactly what happened. And the ones that they kept were the lowest performing ones, so they would mock the black community for the first, right? The whole point of making that affinity groups, for me, came out of a sense of belonging because the black, uh, if you will, the existence of what I'm talking about was blown up in a way, and Thomas Sowell, we talked about it, forced integration was one of the worst things that ever happened to education here. So the affinity groups for me came out of black students often wanting to be belong, and that should have been coming from their community, so they began to, the, the activists began to force it on the districts, and that's kind of the message that we're in there. Thank you, thank you for that. Uh, I can appreciate uh, his comments totally. Uh, I very much am a, a hybrid uh, adult in a sense, because I began school in segregated all black schools in first and second grade, from the fall of 1967 to the fall of 1969. There were no white people at all, the principal, all of the teaching staff, all the students, and it was just a walk up the hill to Hickory Hill Elementary. But then the county closed all of the segregated black schools, and I was now transferred from all black school to the only black kid in my class next year. That was fun times, <laughs> the fall of 1969. Sometimes I'll talk about that at some later point. But in any event, um, I have a final question for this great panel so far. Um, and this comes from, once again, a family experience, a real experience, not abstractions, not ideology, it's just real people. So I was at a Thanksgiving dinner, and I asked a family member, whether one could be an individual in blackness. Simple question to me, didn't seem like rocket science. The family member was tongue-tied and could not answer my question whatsoever. Now, when I review the BLM and the classroom curriculum, all I read is hostility and disdain for the individual. And that puzzles me so much 
Because I know if there are over 40 million black Americans, there must be over 40 million stories, experiences, and perspectives. And they're all stemming from the individual. So what am I missing, panelists? What am I missing about education in black students? Why must politics in the classroom erase the individual? Is there a place for the individual in blackness? Mike will take it away. Oh, that's a big question. That's, that's tough. It covers, it covers so many things. And you only have three minutes. What am I missing? What am I missing? One of the things that Wink and I on our podcast talked about is aspirational identity uh, versus essential identity. And I, I've spoken to a few people here, uh, and, and uh, one notable thing was when they're teaching about uh, Hindus and Hindi culture, it's uh, cows, conflict, and caste. And you can be reduced to that if you don't see within yourself something I actually learned from an Indian person, Atma. This is your soul. This is the spark within you. And we don't often, in our educational uh, situations, ask students to look within. Even Darth Vader said that. Search your soul. <laughs> You'll know this to be true. So you can find truth and inspiration in yourself. And when you take the pledge that some elementary school students do to lifelong learning, you understand that you're incorporating the world of education, the world of knowledge, the world of arts into yourself. And you're discovering that you're not alone. And the more that you learn, the more that you learn that you have something in common with something, someone who might not even be alive. Uh, the historian Neil Ferguson introduced himself, he says, what do you do as a historian? He says, I communicate with the dead. <laughs> and we all have that opportunity. And we can learn, especially talking from someone uh, born in the 60s, we got sick of race riots. We said, how can we make friends? I was there at the Bicentennial, and Casey and the Sunshine Band was saying, shake your booty. <laughs> and all the posters everywhere was a handshake. You may remember that, okay? And we always have the opportunity to make friends. We always have the opportunity to look at somebody and say, I recognize this virtue in you, and it's something that I admire, and I want to be like you. Or I recognize your strength, and I've seen you stand up to bullies, so I want to be like you. And that's what education is for. It's to expose us to the ability to recognize virtues in other people. You don't have to teach virtue. You don't have to make people sign statements. You just have to say, this is what it is. This is what courage is. This is what thrift is. And, and you take it from there. And your imagination can save you. So beware of when they make you march. Thank you, Michael. Uh, Eric. Let me just say that he stopped at three minutes. Like exactly at three minutes. I'm a tough taskmaster, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Yes, and um, I don't prepare, sorry. No, but, that's <laughs> right. um, I want to start with um, my youth. Um, when I was young, I was uh, raised in a predominantly white neighborhood until I was 14. Um, that was not always fun, um, but it was. Um, I was excited to go to high school because the high school was diverse. It was almost literally 50% black, 50% white. I was going to finally find a place where I fit in, where I wasn't a misfit, and I got there, and um, I was too white for them. So I wasn't part of that group. So you're kind of forced to be an individual, um, when the groups won't take you in, right? But this was a good thing. I always correlate individuality with innovation and discovery. Having no way, right, having no group affiliation means you can explore all the groups, right? 
you, you, can, you can figure out who you are on your own and not be told who you are by uh, certain conventions or discourses, right? Um, it was a large benefit that I found myself on my own, discovering things on my own, figuring out what I wanted to do, who I wanted to be on my own. And although it was painful at the time, I'm very thankful for it now. I, I think individualism is not just a good concept, I think it's a necessary concept for anybody who wants to lead a happy and fulfilling life. Because not every path is for everybody, right? Um, so, that's what I'll end with. I made a uh, lemonade out of lemons. Thank you, Eric. Uh, do you have a song? I, um, so yeah, I, I do believe that within uh, a student or a child's knowledge of community and whatever background, legacy, will come individuality. If it's done the right way, like you were saying before, that if it's a group, when we talk about affinity groups, if it's a grievance group, then no, all you're doing is placing bitterness in that child and he's gonna have to deal with that for the rest of his life. But if it's a place of prestige and honor, and I'll end with the same story I talked before, when my mother would tell me those stories, or my father would tell me the stories on the sharecropping field with his father and everything, because, and I thank God, the way that they told me, it wasn't a victimization. Like I told people, they didn't talk about what racism did X, Y, Z. They talked about what they did. They talked about what they built, their stores. Their, you know what I mean? They, they weren't wealthy, they were proud, but they, it was agency. So they didn't use that word but when I got up. So I was very proud of who I was but not in a negative sense, not in a superior, like somehow I'm black American, and people who are Asian, who are white, or beneath me, none of that. That's not what we were taught. And as I got older, I realized everybody wasn't taught that way, right? They, I, I recognized that there, there, there is great strength and individualism in that, because you're saying, okay, this is the collective from where I came, this is something of my background, I'm a musician, so I love the story of Negro spirituals, not just Negro spirituals themselves, but where they came from, a people who refused to just live where they were, and they would grab onto scriptures, and they would sing about, I mean, my Jewish friends sing Go Down Moses, and they're satyrs, right? So, I mean, that's how universal this music was. That music came from my community. That the jazz was an expression of who we are. I love this, I loved about the Cosby Show. They would, all the jazz that was in there all the time, that's a, that's a people. And individuality can come from that, again, if it's done the right way. So that's what I want to say about this. I love that comment uh, so much, because um, I wrote about this. Uh, how did I become black? Um, and it's interesting because I was never aware that I was black until the age of eight when I entered the formerly all-white school in the fall of 1969. That was the watershed of my life. But how did I become black? You could argue, well, wink, you were assigned a race at the segregated colored hospital, St. Mary's in Richmond in 1961, but I don't think that really tells the tale. You could say, wink, you were assigned race when your entire universe was black. Well, I don't think that really does it, because in some ways, you don't see race if everyone else looks like you. It's an invisible thing. I think I became black, and once again, I wrote about this, when I would go to my grandmother's house, because she would babysit me and my sister, on Terminal Avenue in Hickory Hill, and my Uncle James Scott, an entrepreneur, wisely thought his nephews needed to learn about positive black stories. And so there were subscriptions to Black Enterprise Magazine, and Ebony Magazine, and Jet Magazine on Grandma's coffee table. And I would read those things from cover to cover. I would read about John Johnson, the publisher of Ebony Magazine, Barry Gordy, the founder of Motown, Percy Sutton, the head of a radio station network in New York City. Uh, I would read about Reginald Lewis, the entrepreneur who became a wealthy millionaire. I would read about black accountants, black law firms, black doctors. And that's how I learned about blackness. So for my entire life, blackness has always been enterprise, high aim, self-reliance, ambition, drive, talent. And so when my family member said to me, blackness is oppression, nothing else mattered, well, ladies and gentlemen, we had a generation gap. And I'll leave it at that. So having said that, now it's time for questions. Um, we only have 10 minutes. So uh, as my colleague Mar, Mar said earlier, don't tell your life story, but uh, try to keep your questions short and succinct. Uh, yes. <coughs> Hold on, I'm coming with the mic. Oh, sorry. Quick question. How did one go from black is beautiful to blackness is oppression? 
Michael? I mean, yeah. Take it away. Um, <laughs> I have a bad answer. <laughs> <laughs> He's a non-conformer. Yes, yes, we'll tell me that later in private. <laughs> I will. Um, I, I think it's, it's, it's kind of uh, this idea that the, 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 the African Americans have grown a lot. And there are certain people that are still in a certain place. And there's others who've been scooped up. There are some that have been helped along. Uh, so we are actually more diverse. And that's something that a lot of us can't think our way through. That's why the Foundation for Free Black Thought exists, to help people understand that there's more to black folks than just the black folks you know. There's Wink, wherever he came from. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the, the answer that I almost kind of have is way too long. It, 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 yeah. It's, <laughs> And I'll just interject that some of it came in with the politicization of education. When you made the statement that your grandfather, I said, would put out the publications, is that what you were saying? You, you it was, was my uncle at grandma's uncle. house. Yes, sir. And yeah. you used the term positive, which oh, meant yeah. there was an antithesis. Oh, yeah. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For African Americans, like any other people, but since we're talking about African Americans, Black yeah. Americans, yeah. Negroes, whatever the term you're going to use, right? Yeah. There has always, there has been, particularly since. Uh, 1920s, I mean, the, you know, the formation, that it's a history thing, we do this very quickly. There's always been this fight about who gets to tell our story and mm -hmm. how they use it. Now, no people are monolith, so it's a broad, so when I say a broad, I talk about it in my book, mm -hmm. there's a broad story that is the African-American struggle that would be from, you know, an African-American story, right? You have slavery, Jim Crow, all those things. And again, it doesn't fit everyone. Not every black person experienced that even in their families. However, that broad story is one. I, I, I loved the interview that Peter Robinson did with Ian Rowe, Glenn Laurie, and Jane, uh, uh, Robert Woodson about two years ago. Check it out, Google it. It's on Uncommon Knowledge. And one of the conversations they have, it's a subset of the conversation, is called, they called it the 100 Years of Prosperity between the end of the Civil War, 1865, and the end of the Civil Rights Movement, 1965. They called it Growth and Prosperity, that we, meaning as a people, were able to build Black Wall Street, I mean, the Harlem Renaissance, you name it, right, with no uplift. There were no Hell, once again, there was, we did that within our community, like, any, like our Jewish brothers and sisters and everyone else. That story got usurped with, oh, nobody, no, the trouble, I that became the prevailing story for money. Booker T. Washington warned about it in 1911. He said there is a, cat, there is a form of Negro, he just meant for anybody, who will keep the wrongs in front of everybody so they can make money. That was always the struggle within our community. Zora Neale Hurston was a brilliant writer who, died in abject poverty because she took, she said, we're not downtrodden. We built the Harlem Renaissance. And she refused to bow at the altar and this brilliant woman died miserable. Uh, yes. Wait, yes. Okay. Okay, hi. Um, I have a, speaking of uh, who do we choose to tell our stories, um, and particularly who do we platform a privilege for our uh, students in the classroom, I would like to, ask if you could respond to James Baldwin's. Um, he went to, I think, Oxford or Cambridge where he debated and he said that um, the American dream was achieved at the expense of the Negro. Um, and this is something that this year um, at one of the schools is being presented to our students. What are your thoughts about that? Right. Um. Speaking as one who wanted to be the James Baldwin of his generation, yes, James Baldwin didn't always get it right. Uh, one of the smartest people I ever knew, who was a dean at Georgia Tech, said black people are not looking for black leaders. Other people are looking for black leaders so they can say, what do you people want? And then they can settle on that one answer and say, okay, well, we did our share. And that's what a lot of DEI and CRT is right now. Uh, you only know the black people that you know. So get out and know some more. And buy our book. Like it's <laughs> <a black people. laughs> um, question, can you remind me of the uh, Baldwin quote that you, you get yeah, out, you yeah. got it. Yeah. 
the American dream was achieved at the expense of the black man or the Negro. Yes, okay. So you're talking about a uh, debate he had in England with uh, Bill William Buckley. F. Buckley. Uh, who is the poster child for being born on third base and acting like he hit a triple. <laughs> so, so, in that juxtaposition, in that context, I get that statement. I'm a rhetorician, you know, um, and Baldwin said something that uh, was powerful and meaningful in that moment that may not be as powerful and meaningful now, right? Or even in other contexts in that year. <laughs> I, what? Because he was debating William F. Buckley in the early 60s, right? Yes, yes. That's, I'm not going to get it too much into it because yeah, I don't have right. time. Right. 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 Did you, um, okay. No, it's fine. It's fine. I am done. I just. <laughs> I was just going to like use big words and try to sound smart. And, I'm done. I'm done. I am. Done. I'll just piggyback on what he said, the same thing about every 4th of July, they bring out Frederick Douglass's what to the 4th is the Negro, or is the slave. It was written, what, 10 years before the Civil War, right? And he's literally saying there's slavery, because the, the, the Women's League had asked him to be the keynote speaker at the July the 4th, you know, celebration. He's just pointing out the irony, right? He wasn't being disrespectful, he's going, hey, <laughs> slavery is still a thing, right? And so, so but my point is that people will bring that out today, and they'll quote from it, and that's like, first of all, that was then. Secondly, keep reading, because in that same document, he says, the Constitution is a glorious liberty document. He praises the founding fathers. But they don't quote that part, right? They quote the other part. And that's what's about telling our stories. Frederick Douglass is a perfect example. If you get his whole story, you get a much broader picture of black America. Mm -hmm. If you get little snippets, sound bites, or anything, then you're gonna get a very warped view. Uh, the next person. Um, Okay. Thank you. My name is Soraya Dean. Um, I grew up learning Dr. King, who said, uh, the, uh, who spoke about the concept of moral reciprocity. He called on us to look within first before we go out there and blame others. And having said that, he also said. Behind every riot is an unheard cry. So were, is it irrelevant today? What are those unheard cries? I think as social justice activists, uh, how can we get to the root of those cries and offer alternative solutions? Or is every cry not relevant? Michael? I think many Americans have come to the point where we don't see enough about the harsh realities elsewhere in the world. So we can pretend that some of us less fortunate or unequal are really desperate when we're not. I mean, Yemen, Sudan, these are places where we don't care so much about justice. And then we come up with microaggressions in the classroom and say we can cancel people and that's somehow justice. And these people aren't warriors and they're not after justice. They're after power. So we have to keep that in mind and keep our eyes on the real balls and the real injustice in this world. Eric? I, I think a big issue is that we often um, mistake causation for correlation um, and think that uh, if a black person is poor, it's because of racism, right? Um, or it's downtrodden it's because of racism or something like that. Um, that that's a correlation. You know, that, that's, that's not a causation. I think if we're going to hear those cries, we have to hear them individually and in context. I don't think one size fits all when it comes to dealing with some of these issues. So we look at the particular situation, we figure out what can, can help, what is hindering, and we act accordingly, right? And that, that strategy may not work for the next town over, or, or in the next state, or something like that. Um, so that's what we need to do. Those, those, those screams, those, uh, those cries for help are out there, but they're, they're not the same cry for help. If they sound like it, but they're not, right? And I think we need to start thinking about that more. Um, I think context is a very important concept that we don't think about enough. Okay. 
Um, I'm going to, that particular quote, Soraya, uh, and I would invite people to go and Google it and read the whole thing. It's one of the situations, that one of the panelists just said that everybody, Baldwin you know, didn't, didn't get it all right. Dr. King didn't give it right, he's a man. So in that quote, he both condemned and venerated riots. He was trying to have it both ways, because later on in that quote, he ends by saying these, they're destructive, they do this, that, and the other. He should have started and ended with that but he was giving vent to what was actually going on. The problem is that to this day, his words live on and people during the whole BLM thing, they're quoting Dr. King, always out of context. They would never do the whole paragraph. They would do that one part to justify them burning down schools, businesses, that type of thing, right? So but my point is that it, it is an expression, it is a deadly and self-defeating and self-deprecating expression so that it should be condemned. Often it's not condemned. Can I tell one quick story? I'll do it in 10 seconds? Yeah, 10 seconds. 10 seconds. My mother told me about this years ago, once again. She showed me the pictures of the burned out buildings from the Watts riots, although we were living in Northern California at the time. She said, Dumisani, they burned down their own buildings. When she showed me those pictures by then, it was like the late 1970s. She said, those businesses will never come back. So they destroyed their own businesses. She said, never. I was a little kid, didn't really understand. I got older, I went, bam. So when I saw it, I went, ah, that's the okie doke. Yeah, yeah, Black Lives Matter, Black Lives Matter. Burn down their schools, burn down their, right? And then tax revenue is gone, business is gone, right? And they're more oppressed now than they were before. So that's what Dr. King sh sh should have said, with all due respect. Well, I, uh, um, Jen, can I ask your indulgence one final question? Eric, you have to. Is it Susanna? Which one? Yes. I don't know. It's watch. Yeah, right. So the final question will go to Susanna. Uh, and once again, you guys have been great uh, this morning. Thank you very much. There's so much that I want to ask about. So I only have eight minutes. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think one thing that is um, more complex within the American conversation that we fail to acknowledge is, well, and you have to some extent, the changing nature of blackness in America, not only because of the diversity within the African-American descendants of slaves, but now we have an increasing influx of black Americans, first generation from Africa. And we are not having, I think, a solid education among children or um, kind of our population in general about what that means and how these stories are different. And everything kind of just gets all blended up together and just saying, oh, you're black until you have the same experience. And I see there's many instances where that's causing friction within communities and misunderstanding. And there's not um, a, a real uh, teachable moment, I feel like, for kids about how that's, that demographic is really changing. Sure. And so how do you see that in your life or your, your And your experience? each panel will take one minute only to ask that question. <laughs> yes. Um, I, I'm fortunate enough to have recognized uh, Ethiopians that come here, Nigerians that come here. Uh, my family uh, worked in the Peace Corps in, in West Africa. And I see the difference in families. So really, I think it comes down to families, and it comes down to extended families. Uh, and those who have more links with extended families do better, uh, and that's Belize, Jamaica, and so people need to get into anthropology because only anthropology is gonna help us get out of race. Thank race you, Michael. Appreciate that. Yeah. <clears throat> um, there is an academic named Joy DeGroy who wrote a book called The Post-Traumatic Slave Syndrome in which she argued that um, ideas are passed down generation to generation um, from obviously uh, slavery to right now in ways that people coming here from Africa don't have. Um, I get that, but I also think it's a little overstated. Um, I, I think there's enough going on, there are enough opportunities uh, to see outside of uh, your mother's advice um, to uh, get beyond that and, and move forward. It's being used as an excuse right now, not something to talk about, not something to address, an excuse, and that's a problem. I gotta go. Thank you. <laughs> And, and I'll just say briefly that uh, the same theme, the politicization of education, along with the weaponization of the black community, which has been going on for a very, very long time, has created a very toxic mix so that the younger African-American community 
by and large, if they've fallen into this leftist thing that we're talking about now, the grievance thing, they see Kenyans, Ethiopians, Liberians, any of them as the other and as to be attacked. This also goes along with the fact that when you're talking about the, those uh, African groups who have immigrated here over the years, tend to do very, very well. Nigerians among the top in almost everything, right? So there's that resentment there as well. That resentment comes from my own lack of identity, not about what that other person is doing. So all those things are kind of mixed up right now. Thank you. So I wanted to thank all of our panelists. I think this was a great presentation. I'll give them a round of applause.